Hi, my name is Robert Mercer, and I want to welcome you to The Bridge. The Bridge is Asbury's expression of modern worship, and we're so glad that you're spending this time with us. I want to let you know about a couple things that are going on in the life of our community here at Asbury. It's angel tree season for us. Angel Tree is a ministry to people in Shelby County who need assistance this Christmas. We partner with Oak Mountain Missions and Shelby County Emergency Assistance to identify children in our community that could use some Christmas gifts. We'd love for you to participate in that ministry. You can go to asburyonline.org to find more information. Later in December, we'll be doing Rise Against Hunger. Rise Against Hunger is a ministry that ships meals to places all around the world. We'll gather about 80 of us in our gym and package about 10,000 meals. And you might think, wow, how are you going to pay for all that? Well, you know, Asbury sets aside 10% of everything it brings in to go out in mission and service to our community and around the world. Our mission and action team is funding this project. We hope that you'll participate. We also invite you to go to asburyonline.org and find out more information about Rise Against Hunger. We're so grateful that you're here to worship with us. We invite you now to turn up the music and sing with us.
We are in our last week of our sermon series titled Uncomfortable. It's based on a book by Brett McCracken. You know, we are all about comfort in our culture. We want the easy way out. If it's not comfortable, we generally don't want to do it. You know, the first week we talked about how the church is not just a place or a building, it's a people. In week two, we focus on the uncomfortableness of sacrifice, of giving up things that we feel like we need in order to follow Jesus. Last week, we looked at what it means to be a part of this quirky church community. And this week, we're going to be looking at how we need to be vigilant, how we need to be alert in order to be the people that God has created us to be. One of the most humble things and, and one of the things I enjoy the most about being a pastor is that I get to walk with people during very important moments of their life. I can remember when I was on staff at another church many, many years ago, it was a Friday and we had a wedding at the church. And on a Friday before a wedding, there's just all kinds of things going on. The florists are showing up, the caterers are setting up, and it's just a flurry of activities. The uh, father of the, pri of the bride was, was walking around from place to place, and he was just on cloud nine. You could genuinely tell that he was so excited that his daughter was celebrating this moment. At one point, he stuck his head in the office and he said, hey, I figured it out. This wedding is only costing me $290 a minute. <laughs> Weddings are a big deal. Did you know that in 2019, the cost of a wedding averaged about $34,000? That's astonishing to me that people would pay that much for this one-time event. It makes me uncomfortable <laughs> thinking about the amount of money that we spend on weddings. And it makes me understand why, why many parents today say, we'll give you X amount if you'll just elope. <laughs> you know, weddings are a time of gathering two families together to celebrate this important event in a couple's life. It's a Christian covenant. Two people getting married, sharing their love, and saying it's forever. Our scripture today comes from Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten young bridesmaids who took their lamps and went out to meet the groom. Now five of them were wise and the other five were foolish. The foolish one took their lamps but didn't bring oil for them. But the wise ones took their lamps and also brought containers of oil. When the groom was late in coming, they all became drowsy and went to sleep. But at midnight there was a cry, Look, the groom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. But the foolish bridesmaids said to the wise ones, Give us some oil, because our lamps have gone out. But the wise bridesmaids replied, uh, No, because if we share it with you, there won't be enough for our lamps and yours. We have a better idea. You go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, oil, the groom came. Those who were ready went with him into the wedding. Then the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came and said, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore, keep alert because you don't know the day or the hour. In our text today, 
we have this description of a wedding. In biblical days, weddings were just like they are today. They were a big deal. But in many ways, they're immensely different. In the biblical world, weddings were more about survival than about love. (laughs) They were about who can my family partner with to ensure the legacy of our two families. People didn't marry because they loved each other. Now, I am sure that deep love came from these arranged marriages, but it was more of a contractual agreement. It was a transaction than uniting people's hearts in love. When these covenants were made, it was made with great fanfare and celebration. You see, we've talked about it some over this series. They lived in the shame-honor culture where everything was about bringing honor to the family. And if you brought shame to your family, it could hurt you economically, socially. So when you would have these weddings, it would be a big, big deal. The parable of the ten bridesmaids opens with a familiar phrase. You know, Jesus does this to us a lot. The kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is like bridesmaids who are prepared for the groom, and they get to come in and enjoy this banquet. But there's some other bridesmaids who weren't prepared And therefore, they missed it. (laughs) They missed the celebration. And, And of course, this banquet is a symbolic imagery of humanity's preparation for the kingdom of God, the heavenly banquet. The importance of a typical wedding banquet, however, would not have been lost on this first century world. Wedding festivities typically lasted for seven days. And the procession of the bridesmaids and the groom marked the beginning of this long celebration, this joyous event. In this story, it is expected that the bridesmaids would wait for the arrival of the groom and greet the groom with a procession of light in the darkness. Presumably, the bridesmaids are waiting at the bride's home. We don't know exactly where, but that's the assumption that she would be waiting at the home, waiting for the groom to come and get her. All the maids have uh, either lamps or torches, and all are waiting with their lamps lit in eager expectation for the groom's appearance. But the bridegroom is delayed. Now, it's not uncommon for the bridegroom to be delayed uh, during, uh, in these ancient times. Uh, who knows what's happened? The, the scripture doesn't tell us, but conceivably that the two families had to change uh, the contract, which delayed him coming in some way. We don't know, and, and that's not really the concern of the bridesmaids. Uh, They should have anticipated a delay might occur. And due to this delay of the groom, this late hour, the bridesmaids had fallen asleep. Now, that's not a problem. (laughs) The, The prepared bridesmaids and the unprepared bridesmaids both fell asleep and became drowsy. But the wise brought extra oil for their lamps. Both groups knew that the groom was coming and had their lamps burning, but only half considered that they may have to wait and need more oil. When these maids were awakened at the announcement of the groom's arrival, they all set out, turning on their lamps, and then those who weren't ready got freaked out and said, hey guys, we need your help. We're out of oil. 
give us some of yours. And they were like, nope. Because if we give you ours, there's not going to be enough. And we won't be able to do the procession to the groom's house. We have a better idea. You go out, you go find your own oil, and then come back. When the foolish were away trying to find more oil for, our lamp, for their lamps, the groom arrived for the procession, and the procession carried on back to the groom's home. The foolish returned to the processional, and the door had already been shut, and so they knocked on the door, and the groom answered and said, I don't know who you are. Although these bridesmaids were chosen to be a part of this bridal party, and although they waited for the groom to come, it did not guarantee them entrance into the wedding feast. This parable is summed up in verse 13. The imperative is often translated as keep awake. It might be better rendered as be vigilant. In this parable, the bridegroom's arrival was certain. The uncertainty of the timing illustrates the need for constant vigilance. The need for us to constantly be alert. For e the need to us to constantly be ready. You know, readers today, including myself, have a lot of sympathy for these bridesmaids that were not prepared. <laughs> because in our culture, it would be extremely rude to deny someone interest into the wedding feast because they were late. Some of our brothers and sisters in faith come up with all kinds of ways for determining when Jesus may come back. <laughs> They come up with dates and times and all kinds of things. Even though the scripture plainly tells us that we're not going to know the day or the time that Jesus will return. To be an authentic community of believers, we must embrace the uncomfortable parts of the kingdom. And even though some of our friends focus on when Jesus will be back, we have just as many who aren't ready, who aren't vigilant, who aren't alert, whose idea of church is making good citizens and being good people, not embracing the uncomfortable parts of our faith, the parts that truly work on us, and help us to grow. Another challenge we face is we focus on Jesus' return as a future event and ignore the fact that Jesus is here. The kingdom of heaven is here and now at this moment. This parable gives us guidance in order for our community here at Asbury to be ready for Jesus' return, return. But even more than that, be ready to embrace Jesus here and now. In Matthew's gospel, the task we should be involved with is to be vigilant, including bearing witness to God's kingdom by welcoming the stranger, feeding the hungry, visiting the sick, and making disciples of the world. These values for Christian living are really core to our values and life here at Asbury. In fact, you can go online on our church website and look at our our vision and mission, and you can see some of the things that we value here at Asbury. The first thing we need to do is we need to bear witness to God's kingdom. In Christian words, bearing witness to God's kingdom simply means 
living a life, an authentic life of faith. There's a popular quote attributed to St. Francis of Assisi that says, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. You know, in a more modern expression of that is, maybe you've heard this before, that actions speak louder than words. Words are powerful tools, but our actions give a much clearer message of what we truly believe. If your actions don't match your words and promise, then people lose trust. If we as the body of Christ are going to authentically show people what a life and faith in Christ looks like, then we have no option but to live it ourselves. One of the things we value here at Asbury is intentional faith development. Working on our faith so that we can be authentic followers of Christ. Next, we have to welcome the stranger. It's uncomfortable to welcome strangers, isn't it? In fact, that's why we call them strangers, because they're strange. (laughs) But the flip side of that is we're strangers to them. We're pretty strange. And it's so much harder for a newcomer to come into a community of faith, come into a bunch of strangers than it is for us to welcome one newcomer. Here are some ways that I think that we could do to help welcome people in all aspects of life, our church life, our community neighborhood life, our school life, our work life. First thing, smile often. Now, I know we're in a time period where we're wearing masks, but yes, you can see someone smile through a mask. Stop, say hello to people. Let people know that you're genuinely excited to see them. The next thing is choose hospitality. We can choose to be hospitable. Hospitality is another thing here at Asbury that we value high. It's a biblical concept that just encourages you to be purposefully kind to others. Next, don't push an agenda. When you meet someone new, the last thing you need to do is share with them what your thoughts are on the latest hot topics in the world. Next, seek commonality. You know, Maybe I am idealistic, but I truly believe that we as human beings, as people who live in the same community, have more in common with each other than we have differences. And we need to seek out those places where we can be a community living and thriving together. The Gospel of Matthew urges us to feed the hungry, to visit the sick and imprisoned. Participating in service and community helps us to be vigilant. It helps us to be alert. It helps us to know where Jesus is working in the world. Lastly, we need to make disciples of all the world. Now, when you hear this, if you're anything like me, the first thing you think of is witnessing to people and telling people about Jesus so that they can be saved. Now, I believe it's important to share your witness with people. But I think the reason why that first comes to mind is more cultural than it is biblical. Making disciples of the world is a very complicated process that can't be done in one sentence or one track. It can only be done when we build relationships with each other. In order to truly make disciples in the world, we have to do the uncomfortable work of building community. The baptismal covenant for the United Methodist Church isn't just for people who are being baptized. 
It's for the entire congregation. Here's what the formal baptismal covenant says to the congregation. It says, will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these people who are being baptized now before you in your care? And then the congregation responds, with God's help, we'll proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We'll surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. It's our responsibility to make disciples. It's part of being alert. It's part of being vigilant. And we can't make disciples unless we engage into a Christian community, unless we're willing to do the uncomfortable work of leading a youth small group or leading an adult class or participating in things to help us grow and more importantly, to help others grow. This week, a friend of mine shared with me a video on Facebook uh, of a preacher who told this story of Professor Orr in the 1940s who took a group of his theology students on a tour of religious sites in England where many of our great reformers were designing a new expression of the church. One place that they visited was uh, the Epworth Rectory, which was the home of John Wesley. John Wesley is the person who started the Methodist movement, which spread to America and eventually became the United Methodist Church. And John Wesley would pray fervently for revival to take hold. He worked hard on trying to find ways in which to express how God was working in the world to the common person. And he would pray that the church would see this new way of living, this new way of following God. He would pray that the kingdom of heaven would be right here and right now for everyone to be able to access the salvation of God. The work and ministry of John Wesley and also these people called Methodists would indeed usher in a revival. People in mass during his time of the 1700s would come to have faith in God, a new way of thinking. This group of theology students who went through Wesley's house They first came in and they went into the kitchen where John Wesley would eat his meals. And then they went into the library where it still had John Wesley's books and some of them were able to touch the spines. And you're thinking, what's so big deal about that? Remember, these are theology students. They were geeking out a little bit to be able to touch the books that John Wesley touched. And then they went upstairs to John Wesley's private quarters and they went into his room and as they rounded the corner, one of the students saw these these two worn out pieces, these worn out spaces on the carpet. And he said to Professor Orr, he said, hey, what's this about? What, what was going on here? And Professor Orr said, this is where John Wesley would kneel and pray every day. Not for five minutes, not for ten minutes, but for hours and pray. And he had prayed so much there that he wore out the carpet praying for revival of the world. As they got up to leave and went down and got on the bus to go to their next site, the professor counted heads and was missing one. It was like, what happened to every? So he went back into the Epworth Rectory and went into the kitchen and the library and then went up the stairs. And as he went into Wesley's room, he saw one of his students kneeling where Wesley had knelt and he was praying, God, give us revival. Do it again. Let me be a part of it. Professor Orr put his hand on his shoulder and said, hey, we got to get moving. 
And with that, Billy Graham stood up, walked down the stairs, and got back on the bus. God did it again. Billy Graham, one of the greatest evangelists of our time who brought revival in our country. And it makes me think, what would it be like if Asbury, if we would get on our knees each and every night and pray that God would bring revival to our community and our town and would use us to do it. That's uncomfortable. That's asking God to put us in places that we're not sure that we can go. But I know that if we were to commit to doing that, we would be vigilant. We'd be alert. And when Jesus came through our doors and strangers came through our doors, we'd be ready. Let's pray. God, we're just so grateful that you have given us a community to live life together with. Help us to be alert. Help us to be ready so that when we are faced with you, with your people, we can be the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you, turn up the music, sing with us.
Thank you so much for spending time with us this week. We invite you to connect with us through our church website as well as our social media platforms. If you want to worship through giving, you can do that there as well. We so much want to connect with you and be a community support for you. Now know that you're the people of God. Go from this place without any shame or fear to be the people of God, to cause revival in your families and in your community. Amen.